This video is going to cover the 11-3 warm-up and the 11-4 notes. A uh, reminder that you'll open these together in one note and then submit it when that warm-up is, or sorry, when the notes are finished. All right, so in 11-3, we talked about um, finding the area of regular polygons, and we learned the formula was either one-half A, N, S, where A is the apothem, N is the number of sides, and S is the length of each side, or you could do one-half A, P, because P is the perimeter, which is the number of sides times the length of each side. We learned that if you um, had polygons other than a triangle, hexagon, or square, then you needed part of this information. So you actually needed the apothem and you needed the length of each side, and then obviously you could count the number of sides. But with the equilateral triangles, the squares, and the hexagons, you only need one of those measurements because you can use your special right triangles to find the other stuff. So with number one, it says find the measure of the central angle of a regular polygon with 24 sides. This is just the central angle. And to find the central angle, we do 360 divided by the number of sides. And 360 divided by 24 is 15 degrees. Okay, then number two and three is find the area of the regular polygon. For, so for two, this is one, two, three, four, five sides or a pentagon. So the number of sides is five. The length of each side is given, that's eight. And the apothem is also given, that's 5.5. So this would be area is one half A and S or one half 5.5 times five times eight. And then that's just like 0 0.5. In the calculator, you can multiply that all out. And I'd get 110. And the units would be centimeters. So this would be centimeters squared. Number three, one, two, three, four, five, six sides. So this is actually one of those cases where it didn't need to give you both these measurements because you can use your special right triangles, but the number of sides is six. They do give you the length of each side, or sorry, no, they give you the radius here, which is 12. And they give you the apothem, which is six root three. So in order to find the missing side, you actually have two choices. You can do the Pythagorean theorem here, or we'll practice the special right triangles just because you're gonna see those. If I wanted to find the central angle here, I'd do 360 divided by six, which is 60 degrees. And then I would cut it in half to get just the right triangle. So the angle at the top is 30. There's my right angle, this is 60. And if I wanted to use, um, instead of using A, we're gonna use X and X root three, that kind of thing. Opposite the 30 would be the X, opposite the 60 would be X root three, opposite the 90 would be your two X. So if X root three equals six root three, then x is six, which makes sense because the two x is 12, which means x is six also. So half the side length is six, which means my full side length is 12. And then that's the last piece of information I needed for the area. So one half or 0.5 a, which is six root three, n, which is six, s, which is 12. So if it had asked you to keep this exact, I can do like a half of six is three, Three times twelve or three times six is eighteen. Eighteen times twelve is two sixteen, and the root three is there. Square root three centimeters squared. If it asks you to actually multiply that out and round it to the nearest decimal place, you would get three hundred and seventy-four. If it said nearest tenth, it'd be three hundred seventy-four point one centimeters squared. So exact would be the first one. Rounded would be the second one. All right, number four. This is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sided. So N is eight. The length of each side is missing. We have the apothem, which is 15. So here's a case where we need to find the length of each side and it's not a special right triangle. So if I were to, again, draw my central angle here, 
which would be 360 divided by 8, which is 45. Cut that in half, and I'd get my right triangle is 22.5, or the angle at the top of that right triangle would be 22.5. This is the one half the side length, so I need to find this side so I can double it. And the 15 is the apothem, which is here. So if I were to redraw that out, this is what I'm trying to find, which is one half the side length, the 15th is the apothem, and the top angle is 22.5. Since this isn't one of your 30, 60, 90, or 45, 45, 90 triangles, we actually have to use Sokotoa. X is opposite, 22.5, 15 is adjacent. So I'm going to use tangent. Tangent of 22.5 equals x over 15. And then I multiply both sides by 15. 15 times the tangent of 22.5. And I get x is 6.2. But that's just half your side length. So the whole side length there would be 12.4. Then you've got all the information you need. 1 half a, which is 15. N, which is 8. S, which is 12.4. So 0 0.5 times 15 times 8 times 12.4, and you get 744. And it would be inches squared. Okay, and then go to 5. So 5 is your square inscribed in a circle. And the measurement that they give you is this whole segment here. That segment is actually the radius, so it's not the apothem which means if we went this way with it, it would also be four. Which means if I wanna find this segment or the apothem, which is in here, I have to go back to either using your special right triangles or the trick with the um, squares, you can go all the way across, make that four, and then you've got your diagonal and you could take your 45, 45, 90 triangle this way. So there's two ways to do squares. We're gonna do practice the central angle way, which is take your central angle, 360, divided by 4, which is 90 degrees, cut it in half, and you get 45, 45, 90. So now I've got that triangle. I'm going to pull it out, 45, 45, 90, where the one side is your A. These would both be A, and this is A root 2, and that's the side length that you have. So if 4 equals A root 2 and you divide by root two, and you rationalize, you'd get four root two over two, which is two root two, and that's the apothem. So one half A, which is the apothem, two root two, and number of sides, that's four, and S, which is the other piece you have to find. Because it's isosceles, this would also be two root two, but that's only half your side. So the full side would be double that or four root two. Two and one half cancel out. If we wanted to simplify this, four times four would be 16. Root two times root two would be two. And this would be 32. If you multiplied it out in your calculator, you'd end up with the same answer. All right, so that's the 11-3 warm-up. So remember, you're going to add that to your note to submit for today. The good news is 11-4 is a lot easier. 11-4 lays the foundation of what we're about to get into, which is finding the surface area and volume of solids. But in 11-4, you're just identifying the actual solid. So 11-4 is three-dimensional figures. So we've gone beyond just the two-dimensional rectangles and polygons, all that stuff. And now we're, we're going to find measurements of 3D figures. So a little bit of vocab here. A polyhedron is defined as a solid bounded by polygons. So each of the sides of this polyhedron are polygons or faces. The edge is the segment that's formed by the intersection of two faces. So these are segments, line segments. The vertex or vertices in plural form is the intersection point of three or more points. And the plural of polyhedron is polyhedra or polyhedrons. So you can use either one. So if I'm looking at this polyhedron, each of the sides would be faces. 
the segments are all edges. The dashed edges are edges that you wouldn't see if this was a solid figure, but obviously they still exist. And then where all those edges meet would be your vertices. There are two types of solids, polyhedra and not polyhedra, or polyhedrons and not polyhedrons. So polyhedra, polyhedrons could be prisms, pyramids, anything where the solids are actually, you know, like triangles or rectangles or squares or a hexagon, any of those would be polyhedrons. Non-polyhedrons have curved edges. So these are still solids. A cylinder, a cone, and a sphere are still solids, and we're still going to work with these in the future. But they are not polyhedrons because they have curves. So if there's any rounded part to your figure, then it is not a polyhedron. A prism, okay, is um, a solid that has bases and the bases could be any kind of poly, um, any kind of polygon. So the bases could be a triangle, a square, a rectangle. In this case, it's a pentagon. Those are your bases. So sometimes they are top and bottom. They can also be right and left, but they are always going to be parallel to each other. And then there are pa um, parallelograms that connect those, and those parallelograms are called lateral faces. So in this diagram, the pentagon is the base, and the parallelograms, which in this case are actually rectangles, are your lateral faces. They connect the bases. The altitude or height of the prism is the perpendicular distance between the bases. So all of these lines here or segments would be altitudes. You could also draw it from the center in the top to the bottom. They would all be altitudes or heights because they're perpendicular. And like I said before, the bases are parallel. They are also congruent. So those two bases, which in this case are pentagons, are parallel and congruent. When we name a prism, we use the shape of its base. So this one would be called a pentagonal prism. They could be triangular prisms, rectangular prisms, square prisms, hexagonal prisms, anything like that, where there's two bases and then the rectangles or parallelograms connecting them. A pyramid only has one base. So in this, or in this picture, you see this base on the bottom is a square, okay, it could be rectangular, it could be square, but this would be a square pyramid or a rectangular pyramid if it was longer than it is wide. The base is a polygon with n number of sides, so it's three or more, and it has n number of lateral faces that are all going to be triangular. So this time our lateral faces are no longer parallelograms, they are triangles. They all meet at one point, that point is called the vertex at the top, well, there's more than one vertex. All of these are vertices. But there's a vertex at the top where they all meet at. The altitude is still defined as a segment from the vertex perpendicular to the base. So it's still perpendicular. The difference is that the edges are not going to be your height in a pyramid. The height's going to go from the top vertex to the base. And again, you name it using the shape of the base. So this would be a square pyramid. It could be a triangular pyramid. It could be a hexagonal pyramid. Euler's theorem says that the number of faces, vertices, and edges are of a polyhedron are related by the formula F plus V equals E plus 2. So faces plus vertices equals edges plus 2. So if I wanted to count the faces on, this is a cube or a square prism. If I wanted to count the faces, there's the front, the right, the back, the left, that's four, the top, the bottom. So there would be six faces. If I wanted to count the vertices, one, two, let me do it in a different color, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight vertices. And if I wanted to count the edges, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve 
edges. And then we can verify using Euler's formula. Faces plus vertices equals edges plus 2 and 14 equals 14. So we know it works. So a lot of these questions are going to ask you to classify and then verify using Euler's form formula or Euler's theorem, sorry, and that's what it means. All right, example one says, tell whether the solid is a polyhedron. If it is, name the polyhedron, find the number of faces, vertices, and edges, and we are going to add verify with Euler's. So if you look at A, none of these um, sides are curved. So this is, yes, it's a polyhedron. It's a prism, and the base is a square. I know this because all four are marked as congruent. So this is a square, not a prism, sorry, a pyramid. So this is a square pyramid. And the number of faces, one, two, three, four triangles, and five for the base. Vertices, one, two, three, four, five vertices. And edges, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we verify faces plus vertices equals edges plus two. And 10 equals 10, so we're good. B is not a polyhedron because of its curved sides. C is a polyhedron. It's a pyramid and its base is a triangle, specifically a right triangle. So this could be a triangular prism. It could also be a right triangular prism. Faces, front, back, and then left, bottom, diagonal. So five faces. One, two, three, four, five, six vertices. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine edges. And five plus six equals nine plus two. Eleven equals eleven to verify. Okay, some more vocab here. So a cross section is the intersection of a plane slicing through a solid. Sometimes this is hard to picture because you're doing this with a three-dimensional picture uh, or three-dimensional object, and obviously your iPads are not three-dimensional. So if you could picture um, a solid and then a piece of paper or a plane sliding through and cutting it wherever it cuts and then opening up that solid and looking at where it was just cut, the shape you're looking at is called the cross section. So in this diagram, I have a triangular pyramid and then we slice it with a plane and where it slices through would leave a triangle. So this cross section would be a triangle. Last sets of example or example two just says to describe the shape formed by the intersection of the plane and the solid. So you're describing the cross section. In A, and it's almost purple in color, so it's not too terrible to identify. That's a four-sided figure. It appears to be a square. You could have said quadrilateral as well because it's four sides. B is the shape here, which appears to be a rectangle. You could have also said quadrilateral. C one, two, three, is this shape here, which actually is a parallelogram and also a quadrilateral. D is this shape, which is a triangle. And C is a circle. And that's it. That's 11.4. So again, it's laying the foundation of what we're about to do, but we won't do that until after break. You need to take the time right now to submit your notes 
and your warm up. So warm up and notes together in one note so you can get your classwork grade. And then you can use the remaining time to do your 11 for homework on big ideas. The only time you need to show work is when you're verifying Euler's theorem. Have a great day, guys.